Welcome to The Cognitive Crucible, produced by the Information Professionals Association. Our website is information-professionals.org, where you can find links and information about today's conversation and get access to members-only content. Join John Bicknell and explore all aspects of our generational challenge, cognitive security. The Cognitive Crucible is a forum that presents different perspectives and emerging thought leadership related to the information environment. The opinions expressed by guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of or endorsement by the Information Professionals Association. Before we begin this week's conversation with Josh Kerbell, I have with me Mr. Austin Branch, who some of you will recognize is one of the founders of the Information Professionals Association. And Austin next week is going to be leading the panel portion of the virtual event that we're having for IPA members only. And uh, Austin, do you think you could give a quick download of what our IPA members can expect during next week's panel discussion? Absolutely, John. Next week would just be a brief overview and, uh, and discussion surrounding the, the, uh, the restart of Phoenix Challenge. It is DOD's uh, premier convening event hosted by the Office of Secretary of Defense for Policy and Intelligence. And it brings together the whole information enterprise once again after many years of break. We'll be focused uh, talking about the, the, the services, the enablers, our international partners, and whole host of uh, different events over a three-day uh, conference series that, uh, that'll happen at the end of April. Phoenix Challenge will be a, actually will be held once a quarter um, across the globe focused on harnessing the, uh, the enterprise, uh, reducing ambiguity about what's happening across uh, from OSP to the services, to all the joint commands, labs, and so forth, and really brings together and commonly orients uh, all of us. So uh, I'm excited to be talking about that, and, and I'll, I'm hopeful to have a couple of surprise guests from OSD and from uh, the joint staff to join me on that call so we can uh, answer some questions for the members. And, uh, and get folks uh, primed for the Phoenix Challenge Conference Series. All right, excellent. Well, thank you very much, Austin. Appreciate that. And I know our IPA members will be looking forward to hearing a, a really interesting, timely discussion about current initiatives relative to information operations. So thanks a lot. Take care. Bye. Okay, so once again, this IPA members-only virtual social and live podcast recording session with panel discussion, as Austin was just describing, will be on Wednesday, March the 9th at 1800 for about 90 minutes. So 6 p.m. East Coast time to 7.30 p.m. East Coast time. There are links in the show notes so that you can claim your seat at this very special members only social and we hope to see you there now on to today's discussion my guest today on the cognitive crucible is josh kerbell who is a member of the research faculty at the u.s national intelligence university where his primary focus is anticipatory intelligence prior to joining niu he held senior positions in the defense intelligence agency the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, including the National Intelligence Council, on the Navy staff, and the CIA, and with the Office of Naval Intelligence. The views expressed here are his own. Josh Kerbell, welcome to the Cognitive Crucible. Thank you for having me. I've been looking forward to this for a while. Likewise. The conversation I'd like to have with you today, Josh, will focus on what you call anticipatory intelligence and will also get into complexity. And uh, to our audience, Josh has written some articles recently and we'll have some links to those in the show notes. But before we get into these topics, could you please give our audience a little bit more background about your career and the National Intelligence University? Sure, um, let, me, let me reverse it and talk a little bit about the National Intelligence University first and then I'll talk about my career. Um, NIU um, is the uh, intelligence community's only fully accredited degree granting uh, educational research and engagement component. Um, it's a part of the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, uh, which is the organization that was created in the wake of 9-11 um, and uh, 
the Iraq um, situation in order to sort of oversee and better integrate the intelligence community. It's based on the uh, beautiful intelligence community campus in Bethesda, Maryland, right outside of Washington. Um, and at any given time, it has around 700 students um, in various programs. Uh, and NIU has basically three missions. Uh, one is to um, make better intelligence officers and better intelligence consumers um, to educate. Um, one, to conduct research, um, which is really the realm that I am in that is about improving the intelligence enterprise and the broader national security enterprise. And the other element, which is a little bit unique for the IC, is to really engage with outside elements. Um, in many ways, the intelligence community can be very insular, um, not surprisingly, but NIU specifically tries uh, to engage with academia, um, commercial environment, um, other parts of government much more broadly, and so forth. So that's a little bit about NIU. Uh, myself, uh, again, I'm at NIU now. I've been there for about five years. Uh, 20, for 20 years prior to that, I was in the intelligence community proper, mostly in, in um, starting off not in senior, but eventually moving into more senior analytic roles. I was always on the analytical side of the house, never on the operational or collection side of the house. So that's a, that's a part of the that people often are what kind of know from movies and so forth, but I don't live in that world. I live purely in the analytical world. Um, and I focus pretty, pretty much now on anticipatory intelligence, um, which is really about how we think about and anticipate the behavior of the complex strategic environment that we now um, live in. Um, my career is a little bit unorthodox in the, in the sense that I have um, served in a lot of agencies and none of those roles were in what we call JDAs, uh, joint duty assignments um, or, or rotational assignments. Um, all of those were actually moving from agency to agency and um, I was never fired. Um, a lot of people think that people don't get fired in government, but in fact it does happen. Um, I've seen it on a number of occasions. I've never been fired, but um, what usually happens in my case is, is that um, I think leadership sometimes tires of the things that I um, continue to harp on. Um, and uh, you get sort of what, what a British friend of mine once euphemistically referred to, get sent sort of to the back of the class to play with the, the safety scissors and the glitter glue. Um, people you know, just don't want to hear it anymore when there's changes in leadership or if for any number of reasons. And you can either stay there or you can move on. And I've always made it a choice to move on. So. Um, you won't find too many IC officers who have actually worked in as many agencies as those that you read off um, when you read my bio. Um, so it's a little bit of a unique career, um, but interesting. Yeah, Again, yeah, for sure. One things that most people just never have because it's a very broad perspective. Right, yeah. Okay, fantastic. Well, thanks for that. And we'll, we'll see if we can make something interesting today with those safety scissors and some uh, glitter glue here. Um, so you, you've uh, written some articles and it, it seems that you frequently couch uh, discussion of anticipatory intelligence and you make some, some uh, comparisons to the Cold War mindset uh, to, help, to help frame things. Do you think we could maybe start out there? Sure. Um, and this is, it's, it's sort of the crux of everything that I like to talk about. Uh, so the Cold War was the intelligence communities and certainly um, the broader national security enterprises kind of formative experience for us, right? Prior to the Cold War, up until you know, 1947 and the National Security Act, most of our wars were expeditionary. We came, we did our thing, and we went home. But you know, in the, in the wake of World War II, in the Cold War, we were going to sort of be leaders of a peacetime coalition, and we weren't going home. Um, and we set up an organization that was well suited to the kind of world that we were living in. And the Cold War, um, in some ways, was easier compared to today. And I don't mean to say easy when I say this. A lot of times people get, um, they take umbrage and they get upset with me. Um, certainly the Cold War was a very dangerous period and in many ways perhaps more dangerous than the period we live in today. Um, but I think cognitively it was easier. And that is to say that um, it was a highly bounded problem. The Soviet Union um, was to, had clear boundaries, right? Partly by its own, from its own paranoia and partly by American policy of containment. Um, and it was a hierarchical kind of problem, right? Which meant if you had a good idea of what the Kremlin was thinking, you had a pretty good idea of what the Soviet Union was likely to do. Um, and it was a problem 
in such that we might really determine systems parlance as being complicated, right? You could address it by analytical sort of reductive means. And I would argue that the intelligence community and the national security enterprise did a pretty good job with that environment. We were kind of built with that environment in mind, but then, you know, you get into the post cold war period. And I guess we'll talk a little bit about sort of what happened, um, what you're into a world now, um, that is not bounded, right? Um, the traditional boundaries and even the edges are very blurry and it's not hierarchical. It's incredibly networked. And those networks are not only morphing, but they're also growing exponentially in size, right? So the, the, the amount of, of movement across those networks of people, goods, ideas, information, and so forth is just constantly exploding. Um, and this is a problem that you would term a complex kind of problem. Um, and the traditional ways of thinking about a complex problem um, are very different. You know, it, the way, well, not even necessarily traditional, but the ways you have to think about a complex problem are very different from the ways that you could think about a more traditional problem like the complicated Cold War. Um, so that's where uh, my mind is really focused on what do we have to do cognitively and in other ways in order to think effectively about this environment that is now extraordinarily complex and, and growing even more so by the day. Right. So the Soviet Union collapsed and our one of our strategies with the Soviet Union was a strategy of containment. And the Soviet Union collapsed. There was no longer that same kind of a containment uh, 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 policy. Uh, but simultaneously, there was this you know, beginning of the tech revolution that we're still living in, where this networked world uh, emerged. And so now we're in this, this borderless competition below the level of armed conflict. And this is what I think you're describing as a much more complex environment compared to the environment of the Cold War. Does that sound about right? Absolutely. So you have a few things that are in play, right? I mean, sure, you have the Soviet Union implodes um, in that period, you know, in, in 89, the Berlin Wall comes down, and everything behind it starts to connect with itself in the outside world. In 91, the Soviet Union itself implodes. Um, and in that, you have the largest piece of territory that had essentially been disconnected by partly by American policy. Um, starts to connect with itself and connect with the outside world, right? The internal hierarchies start to sort of blend. Um, and then it connects with the outside world. So that's the largest piece of territory. But then in the case of China at the same time, really um, post Tiananmen, so um, in 19, really in 1992, China starts to open up um, after, after Tiananmen, um, which happened in 89. And you begin to see China, which is now the largest population begins to connect with itself and the outside world. And that process of those, of those sort of um, geographic and regional and national boundaries eroding um, is aided and abetted by that third thing, which is the information technology revolution, which you already alluded to, um, which sticks its fingers into China and Russia and everywhere else and just continues to explode um, sometimes when I talk about this, people say, well, yes, but those things, you know, I mean, information technology all, always existed, um, but really not like we're talking about post um, creation of the World Wide Web, right? So after, you know, Tim Berners-Lee come to create the World Wide Web, you know, you're talking about a kind of uh, technology where in, in earlier iterations of increasing complexity, um, st sailing ships, steamships, you know, telegraph, telephone, radio. Um, most of those, the ability to broadcast was solely the purview of, of governments, corporations, or really wealthy individuals. Um, but that changed in this wave of information technology revolution. So really since 1989, now in this period, it's now possible for almost anybody anywhere in the world with a cheap cell phone, um, an internet connection and a social media app to theoretically tap a finger and broadcast and reach millions, if not billions. Um, and in that way, we're in a very unique period, right? We've never seen this before. So we, yes, it is 
the world in some ways perhaps was always complex, but but not like this. Right. And I, I heard you speak in another forum and you actually gave a just a, a stunning example of, of this. You, you described a a I think you for, for effect, you even said I saw a, a black and white photo of, of a Chinese man who was like working the fields in rural China and everything looked like it might have looked for the last you know many hundreds of years many many millions of chinese yes. men have been doing this very same thing uh so on one hand it's pretty ordinary but it was extraordinary uh, in that this this gentleman had like a cell phone <laughs> tie, you know tie, in his hand it's like that that's very different and that changes everything the time when he wouldn't have known perhaps what was going on over behind the mountains that were right in front of him and now he has a connection to the world, both the ability to communicate outwardly um, and have information come inwardly. Right, right. And so to, to your point, it used to be that the domain of uh, information promulgation was reserved for the kings and, and queens to nobility, to very rich people, to wealthy people, to now everybody. Everybody is a publisher and distributor of information, and that that uh, combined with these other uh, changes that you were describing just really changes the problem uh, in in ways that are difficult to comprehend. No, it really does, um, and it's again, it's really this is like the first time we've seen this really in you know. So again, we have seen obviously increases in. in technology that have allowed the flow of information right but most people they they had a radio but they didn't have a radio station oh they yeah television but they didn't have a television station right they could pick up a telephone and they could call somebody point to point but the thing that's fascinating and in many ways most challenging about the world we live in today is that just about everybody has the means um to broadcast and to do it easily and to reach unbelievable numbers of people with a tap of a finger. Um, and that is a really unique information environment. Right. right. And, and this network phenomenon that you mentioned a few moments ago is not limited to social media. It's, uh, you know, COVID has a network component to it. Plus there's uh, supply chain uh, issues, which are especially vivid right now on the national security landscape. All, all of this has uh, network components to it and contributes to the complexity that we want that uh, that we're grappling with. Would you say that's fair? No, absolutely. So, I mean, obviously, we, we tend to spend a lot of time focusing on sort of the virtual components, the information networks that are so unique and so explosive in size and speed. Um, but certainly the physical networks have also exploded in size um, in this period as well, right? Uh, airlines became deregulated, people began, you know, flying became a much more common phenomenon. If you look at the numbers of people who have traveled out of China, or even into China, but out of China, um, only in the last 20 years, from almost nothing in the last 35 years, from almost nothing to just huge numbers. Right now you can't walk around, well, pre-COVID, you couldn't walk around Europe without, you know, running into just huge groups of Chinese tourists, right? That's a relatively recent phenomena. Um, so, and in addition to travel, um, it's the numbers of, of just physical trade, right? I mean, globalization is actually a phenomena that's been with us forever. Um, but certainly um, with the creation of the manufacturing base in China and so much being manufactured there and then having to transport, um, the, the, the physical networks for the movement of goods um, have just exploded, right? And you can see this in something as simple as COVID, um, right? We've always had pandemics, you know, in that sense, it's true. The world has always been a complex phenomenon, but, you know, COVID appears and within months, it is a worldwide phenomenon. That's from my understanding faster, um, much, it happened much faster than did the Spanish flu in 1918 um, and certainly faster than did the Black Death um, as it slowly moved across the world, you know, just people didn't move as fast. Um, so these things didn't move as fast. 
but now you know it's it's like with Ebola, right? There used to be a time when somebody contracted Ebola in in Africa, um, there wasn't the physical network for them to get out of Africa and get somewhere with it alive, right? It killed them before they had that opportunity to move. But we're not in that world anymore. It is now possible to contract Ebola and be on a plane and within hours be on the other side of the world still alive, right? So um, these physical networks that have exploded and pretty much these physical networks have stuck their fingers into every part of the globe. I think I saw a statistic, um, maybe it came from the BBC, but that you can um, you can get from anywhere on the globe to any other world spot today, essentially where there are people in less than 20 hours. All right. Is that right? Um, wow. That's, that is that's something yeah. extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, uh, sidebar on that, this is something that seems kind of related to what you were saying is like there, there are now very few places on earth where, where, where someone can go and not experience any kind of man-made noise. Like, you know, e even like an, an airplane flying over a head, you know, there's very relatively few places where you can actually situate yourself and just be completely in ambient nature. Uh, so similarly, there are also relatively few places on Earth or there's there's increasingly smaller geographies where people can go and and experience the night sky without any kind of. Uh, light pollution, light pollution. Um, yeah anyway it, it's they're uh, opposite sides of the same coin there you you can get to anywhere very quickly and simultaneously people and and, and people's footprints are everywhere um uh you know so we're talking about uh, you know co comparing and contrasting uh 30 50 years ago to today um with within your circles Josh, is there uh, any kind of a uh, palpable sense of urgency or a, a, a change in the uh, feelings of, you know, that, that there's something different going on compared to, say, 10, 20 years ago? I, I think, yes, there, there is a feeling, um, and it's pretty universal, but the response to it is not. Um, there are a lot of people who still, I think, look for reference points in the past, um, which is not surprising, right? Because, you know, it's, you look for places to kind of give you some kind of comfort, some kind of mooring as to some kind of guidance on how to deal with the problems. You know, it's the first place you look is you look backwards and say, how, how did we deal with this in the past? Um, and that can be useful. It is. I'm actually a historian by, by academic training. Um, but at the same time, there are dangers involved in that when the circumstances are very, very different, right? We often, we latch on to the comparisons and we sort of miss the contrasts or we minimize the contrasts. Um, and I think we're seeing this happen actually today with some of the some things that are going on with both Russia and with China, right? On, 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 on one level, um, both of them look like more traditional kinds of security you know, strategic challenges, and you might want to respond to them. I would argue a lot of people are arguing that we should in the ways that we did in the ways of the, in the Cold War, right, with that kind of response. But I would argue that that today's Russia and today's China, these are very different creatures in the sense of how enmeshed they are into that in information and physical environment that we already talked about, right? Um, so, the, so the old playbook is not necessarily going to give us a lot of comfort um, and I think that's sort of a challenge is to getting people to understand that, yes, it, this is an extraordinarily different challenge and you actually have to do something differently. And to be honest, it's hard for an organization that's been very successful at something to want to do something new or different, right? So they, they often want to do what I call more, better, stronger, faster, smarter, right? They want to do mm -hmm. what they've always done. They just want to do more of it. Right? They want to do it faster and they tell themselves if they get better, um, then that will be sufficient to the problem because it's a, it's a, you know, it's a quantitative problem about more. And I would argue in this case, that's not necessarily the case. Um, we can't just do more, better, stronger, faster, smarter. We really need to do different. And it's hard. 
Um, and the thing is, as I would, as I mentioned, I think that we overall were pretty successful with regard to the Soviet Union. So you know, you want to look to your successes um, for for sort of guidance, right? It's it's kind of like the Kodak problem, right? Sometimes we talk about that, you know that. Kodak was so good at doing something that even though it actually invented the very thing that sort of changed photography, um, it was really slow to picking up on it because it just wanted to get better, right? In some ways, you know, it could make better film. It could make, you know, sort of better chemical photography, even though that it itself had rendered that in some ways, just sort of a niche obsolete kind of thing. And I think that that's where we kind of are with a lot of organizations that live in the information realm. Right, as we sort of, you know, I'll talk about the intelligence community, you know, just we want to get better at what we've always done. Um, and I think that's the wrong um, response. Maybe that's part of it, but it's insufficient in and of itself. I see. I see. Well, so we've been talking around it a little bit. I, I guess I'd like to just ask you to expound more directly. So you, you, you're a proponent of what you call anticipatory intelligence. Can you unpack that a little bit more, uh, explain why you think that's needed, why, why you frame it that way, uh, what's, what's different about it, um, et cetera. Absolutely. So um, first I should say that anticipatory intelligence um, is, is picking up traction in the intelligence community and in other places. And that is to say, um, it first appeared in the National Intelligence Strategy in 2014, um, after many years of, of some of us screaming about it, um, and then again in 2019. So it has become what we call a mission objective in the intelligence community. The intelligence community has essentially three mission objectives. One of them is what we refer to as strategic intelligence. One of them is what we refer to as support to current operations. And the third is anticipatory intelligence. Um, support to current operations, basically things that are going on in the world, is sort of self-explanatory, so I won't spend any time there. But there's this, these two other mission objectives, strategic intelligence and anticipatory. In a nutshell, strategic intelligence is really deep knowledge on things that are already identified problems, right? That we are watching, we're monitoring, we're constantly updating, and we're doing some estimative work, right? maybe making some projections about how these things will develop into the future. Um, anticipatory intelligence is really, a, as opposed to being about deep knowledge on a narrow, already identified issue. Anticipatory intelligence is about looking at the world very broadly um, as a complex system and trying to think about, which is in many ways has to be a very creative, imaginative process, how new issues will emerge, right? We're talking about a phenomenon called emergence. Um, which is a term of ours uh, that goes with complex systems theory. A lot of people just use the term to mean anything coming along, but really in terms of systems parlance, it means um, the appearance of, of sort of collective macro behaviors that are not sort of driven by any one top-down central point, um, but that grow organically out of that interconnectivity and interdependence. Um, so anticipatory intelligence, as originally conceived, was intended to be about thinking about how emergence happens in this environment, right? Um, that's the idea. Now, there's been a lot of arguments about what is it, how it's defined. Part of that is because a lot of people who didn't know anything about systems or about complexity um, helped define it, which is, you know, sort of creation of a committee that in many ways wasn't necessarily well equipped to define it. But um, I would argue that most of even all of today's most significant major strategic challenges are really emergent phenomena, right? Things like climate change, globalization, urbanization, extremism, misinformation, disinformation, cyber network effects, um, and of course, pandemics. All of these are emergent phenomena. Um, and I would argue that these are at the sort of the top of sort of the things that we need to focus on, and therefore um, anticipatory intelligence is crucial. Um, because in the time from emergence to impact can be very quick, particularly in a really highly interconnected world. You don't have time to say, okay, there's the problem. You, you can't just wait for the problem to appear, right? You have to be sort of thinking about it 
hence anticipating it before it does. And it's a hard thing to do. It requires a whole set of, of different cognitive skills to do this. Um, and it's not what the intelligence community or the broader information community was really created with that in mind. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for, thanks for painting that. So a um, couple of follow-ups. So it, it seems like you're, you're talking about something different than like simple prediction, like, you know, uh, next state prediction, like what, what things will likely look like tomorrow, like, or you know, uh, like uh, operational prediction that companies are using today to help manage their business. You're, you're talking about something deeper and more subtle. Would you say that that's, that's fair? Absolutely. So, so, you know, you can, you can get into all kinds of arguments over the definitions, but, okay, but yeah. intelligence is not about prediction, right? Prediction is often about the, the sort of, the, you know, trying to project into the future. It often involves a lot of extrapolation, sometimes within a range, we talk about the cone of plausibility, um, but, but more defined, you know, possibilities at the end, but right. It, intelligence is really about not about prediction not even so much necessarily purely about plausibilities but it is about this broader range of possibilities right and thinking about what could um from this set of conditions this really highly complex set of conditions how could things combine in what ways to lead to what kinds of phenomena um, sometimes it may be a good thing right we often tend to think in a very negative sense when we think about it in intelligence terms right like what are the threats um, but it can sometimes be a good thing. And, you know, we, in, in futures, we talk about, you know, creating your future, right? Um, but it can also be a bad thing, which means, you know, thinking in advance about what are the things you might put in place to, to prevent it from coming to fruition. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So like, yeah. So like s simple prediction, it might have as uh, a foundational uh, you know, given as part of the problem is that, you know, what, what happened in the recent past is going to resemble what will likely happen in, in the, in the near future. Whereas uh, anticipatory intelligence or complex systems dynamics and emergence, those types of assumptions are, are not always uh, given in the problem set. Absolutely. So in the realm of, of thinking about this kind of a thing, um, you're right. There, the the traditional, you know, looking at the past and the current and projecting or extrapolating that into the future, um, is is something that you don't want to focus on, right? You really want to get away from that. Um, and this is where analogical thinking can be can be really problematic. We have this sort of tendency to do this, you know. Um, again, from a history background, analogies can be wonderful things, right? But you're often looking for what's the same. You're looking for those similarities. Um, and where we get in trouble tends to be that we miss the contrast. We really, um, we miss the differences. Um, so really, you, you know, you have to be very careful about extrapolation uh, in, in, in doing this. And yeah. Point in anticipatory intelligence to be to be very aware of the dangers of extrapolation and, and if and when we do it um, to be aware that, that that's often leading us to places that, that just won't come to fruition right because oftentimes whatever you think is most likely comes from that kind of thinking and we know from experience that that's what we often think is most likely is not the thing that comes to fruition yeah yeah uh, but one more like kind of a clarification type question on, on this and, and you might have already mentioned it when you talked about the different uh the the different major buckets for the intelligence community's efforts but is do you contrast anticipatory intelligence and uh strategic surprise is it the same same thing or is anticipatory intelligence trying to uh, uh, prevent strategic surprise? So it is. I mean, there's a lot of debate around the term strategic surprise, which is where you get to some difficulty, right? I've, I've written a little bit in the past about, you know, in many ways, the word strategic is, is problematic for us because it, different people use it in different ways, right? Um, it can mean sort of a temporal component, right? Sort of often meaning long term. But then, you know, what is long term? Is it six months or is it five years? Um, it can have um, a breadth component, meaning strategic is kind of a big picture kind of look, 
right? Or it can have an impact uh, kind of meaning, right? Sort of like strategic weapons, right? The mere use of them would have sort of this impact on the system that is something, you know, qualitatively different from other things. Uh, so so the, sometimes the word gets problematic, but without dwelling on that too much, yes, I would argue that both strategic and intelligence, strategic intelligence and anticipatory intelligence can be focused on strategic surprise, depending on how you define that term. But certainly we are, right? We're, we're trying to think about the system very broadly and trying to anticipate um, things that could emerge uh, that would be problematic to deal with if we only started to focus on them at that point, right? This is really right. we're thinking about yeah. things kind of yeah. beforehand, right? It would have been good if we had been thinking about climate change um, before it really emerged as something that was in full play, right? Because now we're, yeah. we're kind of behind the curve. So um, now you can debate whether or not climate change was a strategic surprise. I would argue in some ways it was, but not for everybody, right? It's just yeah. Yeah. had to be thinking about, you know, you put that amount of carbon into the atmosphere, what's going to happen. But we, we didn't really start to get, you know, a lot of broader attention to it until you start seeing super storms and other things that seem to be manifestations of that. I see. I see. Yeah. No, I, I, uh, you know, hear you, and, and, and presumably, you know, these are lot. You're 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 distilling lots of conversations that you've had with your colleagues over over many many years. And uh, I mean, this this is live stuff, right? This this is the here and now. This is stuff that the intelligence community is grappling with right now. And so these these definitional terms are. Uh, living breathing terms <laughs> that are that are being debated and um, yeah so having crisp uh definitions uh would seem to be frankly uh, inappropriate at this moment given given that that these are uh, things that are um uh being being dealt with uh, currently so it doesn't surprise me that there's a little bit of uh, play in the joints in some of these terms um not, it, it, you're right. You know, there is there needs to be room. And at the same time, though, you do have to have some kind of agreement as to what you mean. Otherwise, people talk past each other. Right. We just, you know, what what it means to me and what it means to you are two entirely different things. Uh, and then we don't make headway. And that's often been a struggle with sort of trying to figure out what exactly is anticipatory intelligence. Sure, sure. Um, we, we had on the podcast a, a while back uh, a, a pioneer, actually, in complex system science, a gentleman named Yanir Baryam. You, you may know him or be familiar with him, Josh, but... We but, don't know each other really well, but we've, we've crossed paths in various venues. Yeah, yeah. But uh, Yanir made an interesting comment during our discussion, uh, and I... You know, I, I'm I'm paraphrasing here a little bit, but he he basically w was saying that the same kinds of things that you're saying is that our historical tools for analyzing data um, are you know wonderful, glorious. They've they've served us very well for a long time. They're going to continue serving us well for a long time. But those tools, the statistical and probabilistic uh, tools, are just not up for this challenge space and they there there needs to be some some new computational tools uh, developed in order to help understand complex systems and be able to manage them do you have any thoughts about the kinds of uh, tools that are either being prototyped or being deployed that that are going in the right direction any, any speculations along those lines at all I do. So I, I'm 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 not a computational scientist in the sense that I don't think about the problem so much uh, in the compu computational terms that a lot of complex systems theorists tend to. So I take, tend to take a much more qualitative approach. But there are a number of things um, that we can do to help us think uh, about these problems more effectively, um, cognitively. Uh, number one, um, in terms of tools, uh, visualization techniques, I think, are vital, right? And that is, I mean, 
in a place like the intelligence community, we often tend to be a very prose based community. Even today, we're very often focused on our language um, and how we write. And we spend a lot of time teaching that to people. Um, and while that's important, still, you still need to be able to sort of paint a picture in words. Um, really, one of the things we're going to be able to do to, to understand complexity is you really need good visual tools. Um, so I would say that is one area and related to that. Um, I think our language, um, which is also a visual tool for us, right, in that we paint pictures with it, um, is often a, 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 an issue. And I spend a lot of time talking about this. This is an area of particular interest to me. Um, and let's look at particularly things like our metaphors, right? So um, if you look at intelligence community products historically, um, or even if you look at the broader national security literature, you'll see language that is often drawn from the realm of Newtonian mechanics, right? We talk about exerting force, um, applying pressure. We talk about um, inertia, momentum, tension, leverage, trajectory, right? This is the language of Newtonian mechanics. And it's wonderful um, for thinking and, and, and describing complicated problem sets, be problems that behave in a very linear kind of fashion, right? In many ways, like the Cold War, which was, a, again, as we talked about earlier, sort of a two-body problem, which tended to behave in this fashion, right? Um, the problem is, is that we have a great deal now, about 40 years of really great cognitive linguistic research that shows us um, how our metaphors are really mental models, right? The, sort of the seminal work done by Lakoff and Johnson and others, um, really exploring how, um, how these are our mental models. And if you have the wrong mental model, you know, you set yourself and anybody who reads that language um, misapplied metaphors, um, you sets them up for surprise, right? So um, really, I think one of the things we're going to have to do, and this is not an area that a lot of people in the IC or even maybe in the broader national security enterprise spend a lot of time on, but we really need to start focusing on the language we use to describe, to sort of paint our pictures, right? Ideally, describe a complex problem, we would be using metaphors and language drawn from more organic problems, right? So sort of like emergent problems, right? So language drawn from fields like metaphors, epidemiology, um, biology, ecology, meteorology, and so forth, but not Newtonian mechanics, um, which is so just infused throughout the literature. Um, and that brings with it a whole bunch of problems, like how do you, you know, people, it seems awkward to a lot of people. Um, but fundamentally, so some of the things that I would, I focus on, not, or not unless the computational models, but things um, like our language, um, like our visualization tools, which are interconnected, right? Because um, language and these tools are vital to our cognition. Um, so those are just some examples of some other areas. I frankly worry a little bit about the discussion that I see about um, anticipate uh, uh, about um, artificial intelligence and, and you know uh, machine learning and other things. Not because it's not these are not vital tools for our future in thinking about these things, but as I mentioned earlier, I often see people and hear people discussing them in terms of better, stronger, faster, smarter. Right? How do we sort of shoehorn them into our existing processes so we process more and we get better at what we've always done? Um, and I worry sometimes that that's not what we ought to be doing. These things open up the door to us doing things very differently, not just you know getting better, um, but we don't always think about them in those terms. So, but again, yeah. that's yeah. Sort of outside my realm of specialty. I'm I'm much more focused on things like methods, um, our language, you know, our, our visual models for thinking about complexity. Mm. Yeah, that is a fascinating response, Josh. Um, I'm curious, another uh, podcast that we did a while back was with a fellow named Brian David Johnson, who um, created a technique known as threat casting. Have you ever heard of threat casting? And does that kind of a, well, for, first of all, do, do you know what that is? I do. Um, I, it, I, I, I should, uh, full disclosure, um, so Brian David Johnson is at Arizona State. Yes. And uh, the threat casting lab there um, does some fascinating work. I actually love that. Um, full disclosure, my daughter is actually a student at Arizona okay. State. Yeah. Um, 
and we talk about this. We love this whole idea of sort of this sort of interdisciplinary approach, which is really what threat casting is about. Um, and I would argue that threat casting fits in sort of this this realm of things that I call um, synthetic tools and techniques. Techniques, right? Sometimes we call them holistic tools and techniques, um, and they're quite creative and imaginative, um, which I think, you know, holism is about putting things together and seeing sort of the whole um, same thing with these sort of synthetic techniques. Um, and we in the IC do some of this. I don't know that we're necessarily doing what would technically come under the realm of threat casting. We probably are some people, um, but certainly we do a lot of modeling, gaming, and simulation. And I say a lot, it's still certainly a minority, but um, same kind of realm. So that's a long way of saying that, yes, um, these kinds of synthetic techniques, what I will call synthetic techniques, um, that, that threat casting, I think, comes under that umbrella, are vital to thinking about complex systems and emergence. Uh, and they're, I call them synthetic because in many ways they're different from what we traditionally do, right? We call our thinkers in the intelligence community, we call them analysts, right? And that of course, you know, the, and the term comes from the Greek, it means to, to break things down. Um, we tend to be a very reductive community, right? We attack problems by breaking them down um, and approaches like um, threat casting and modeling and gaming and simulation um, are really not that. They're, they're much more synthetic techniques. They're about putting things together and imagining um, how those combinations of things um, could play out, right? Right. So you can see emergence. So, um, so right. a long answer, but a way of saying, that, yes, I think threat casting comes into this, into this quiver of synthetic um, tools and techniques, and, and, and that's crucial to thinking about a complex environment. Right. And uh, uh, BDJ's work uh, frequently, or m maybe always, um, I'm not sure whether that's actually true, but I, frequently uh, it includes putting these future scenarios into a comic book-like uh, presentation, which I think has the effect of, you know, putting the uh, reader of the scenario into a different mind state. It, 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 it's kind of like a, a connection point with your, your, your visualization, um, uh, you know, de desire to have better visualizations to help understand problems. And if you can kind of like turn off your factual brain right and and go a little bit into the world of make-believe or into the world of well let's just say this is possible but it's not an actual thing in a comic book setting it just helps put put it it helps uh, prepare the mind for uh insights that might not otherwise come if you're looking at it in a linear fashion or like a, a Newtonian fashion as, as you were describing, Do you, would you say it that really kind of does. thing? It yeah. does. I, I love the comic book format. Uh, and they have at ASU, they have a bunch of them, of some of these examples posted on their website. I recommend it. Um, it does go to this sort of visual and this different way of thinking. Um, the challenge with it is in a community like one that I live in, is that people often see it as kind of gimmicky and that's it's not serious, right? How can it be serious? But we're really serious because we work in, in, in words, right? There's paragraphs of text and maybe there's some really neat sort of, you know, some annotated maps or some kinds of graphics or tables or sort of the things that we would traditionally associate, you know, with, um, you know, being serious. Um, yeah, but you know, I, 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 they're very serious, you know. But people, so it, I think it's just a challenge, right? You know, to yeah. to do this. But even I think in the IC, we're beginning to see some glimmers of appreciation for this kind of an approach. Yeah, you know, I I asked BDJ about that very kind of thing directly. Uh, I asked him, you know, over the last. 10 years when you've been doing this, or maybe he's been doing it 15 years, but if you can compare the, the military and governmental people that you were working with 
10 or 15 years ago and compare them to today's cohorts that are going through these threat casting exercises, do you have any kind of comment about about their the, the way that they're approaching these kinds of projects? And he said, yeah, absolutely. You know, 10 years ago, people would come in and they'd roll their eyes, you know, what the hell are we doing here? This is, this is silly, you know, <laughs> I'm not into comic books or, you know, whatever, you know, that, that was then and, and today, you know, there may still be some lingering echoes of that, but the, today's leaders uh, uh, tend to be a lot more receptive. Uh, I, I don't know. They, 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 somewhere along the line, they got the memo, or or uh, today's leaders are are more amenable to experimentation and innovation in a way that it, it that that was different ten or fifteen years ago. And may, maybe you're observing the same kind of thing. I, I think so. I think also it's, you know, it's a generational change, right? Um, and this is where I, you know, for all my frustrations that it's been hard to push the idea of anticipatory intelligence and get it accepted, um, you know, within my community. Um, at the same time, you know, I think we're slowly seeing generational change. We're beginning to see generations that grew up in this information environment, right? I'm increasingly find my, fi finding myself talking to audiences of people who were born in the 1990s, right? Who all they really known is this really sort of rich, dense, complex environment. And in many ways, um, some of these techniques like threat casting or even comic books and other kinds of visual approaches um, are much more sort of normal to them right they they see this as part of you know a, a, this is not something strange it's not something different um so i'm i'm hopeful as we continue to watch sort of the generational shift um that that we'll see greater accept, acceptance for for these kinds of approaches and techniques yeah well right well on on that you know somewhat hopeful note um uh, i'd like to thank you josh for being on the Cognitive Crucible, and I wish you and your colleagues within the intelligence community Godspeed as you orient and uh, mitigate risk around these problem sets that are everywhere today. And uh, with that, Josh Kerbel, thank you so much for being on the Cognitive Crucible. No, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. The Cognitive Crucible is the only podcast dedicated to increasing interdisciplinary collaboration between information operations practitioners, scholars, and policymakers. To find out more about the Information Professionals Association, visit us at information-professionals.org. Please support our podcast by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review.